These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. As we begin our episode today, King Arnawanda has died. There is quite a lot that was unclear about the later years of his reign, and as we noted, he seems to have spent his later years focused on domestic matters, perhaps even to the exclusion of certain foreign affairs. In his final years, the Hittite Empire has been stalled out, a victim in a sense of its own success, as Arnawanda's incredibly successful pushes into the Mitanni heartland caused the Egyptians and Hurrians to put an end to a century-long struggle over Syria. In fact, if we believe one of the very few Mitanni accounts, it was not the Mitanni on the back foot begging for an alliance, but the Egyptians, fearing that the Hittites would next move against their Syrian possessions that spurred the marriage. Further conquest in the east was denied to Arnawanda, but he still needed to keep his attention committed in this direction, since if he moved against his threats to the north or west, then he faced an almost certain attack from the united Mitanni and Egyptian forces. It occurs to me that two episodes ago, I may have portrayed Arnawanda as a bit passive in his later years, and this was the case for sure, but we need to recognize that this passivity was probably the best course available to him at the time, not a result of laziness or lack of ambition. Even though we're about to discuss how his failure to break out of the situation is going to lead to perhaps the darkest hour in Hittite history, we should recognize that he may have been in an impossible situation. And unlike most kings who ruled over a national decline, it's hard to fault Arnawanda, or indeed any of the kings after Tudhalia, for the external situation they faced. We've already seen the seeds of what is to come in the two troubles that plagued Arnawanda's reign. In the north, the Kaskans appeared to be unstoppable. Sure, the Hittites could organize an army to defeat one force, but they came in groups of a few hundred, just large enough to overwhelm a small village and small enough to slip away again afterwards. Even if the army caught one, or a particular village put up resistance, these tiny armies were everywhere, wandering all over the north section of Anatolia. In the west, meanwhile, control was slipping. The nations defeated by Tudhalia had never been happy as vassals, and many of the kings who were brought into the Hittite government itself and given western borderlands were notoriously unreliable. Arnawanda attempted to control these with his instructions texts and with light civil reforms, but the fundamental problem was that the Hittites were unable to commit large amounts of soldiers in the west without risking disaster in the east, and these western kings appear to have known this. With Arnawanda's death, he was replaced by either a son or a son-in-law named Tudhalia. This one is usually called Tudhalia III, and I'm going to completely skip over the controversy around his name and the uncertain king, Hattusili II, because neither of them really matter, and more importantly, they aren't interesting. There may, though it isn't certain, have been a succession crisis here, but it was over quickly. What is interesting is that with Tudalia III's ascension, the northern floodgates really open in a way we haven't seen before. The Kaskans, the semi-nomadic people of North Anatolia, go from terrifying threat to apocalyptic. Actually, this probably has nothing at all to do with Tudhalia himself. Oftentimes, we as historians like to credit a new king for sudden new threats, suggesting that either the transition of power or the newness of the king on the throne looked like an opportunity to the kingdom's enemies. However, this was not the case with Tudhalia. As we saw in the previous king's reign, the Kaskan threat has been rising more or less unopposed, and it seems likely that even if we still had the previous king, the Kaskans would be picking this time to start pouring out of the mountains in huge numbers. We have a few fragmentary letters in which local governors complain about bands of 400 to 600 men appearing in the night to pillage fields, before vanishing with the rising sun, giving an impression not unlike a horror movie. The king replies with strict instructions, threatening blinding and mutilation if his instructions are not followed promptly and to the letter. 
but he sends only letters, not reinforcements, for those troops must be kept ready in case the Cold War on the Syrian border grows hot. Then suddenly, these raids become pillaging expeditions, and faced with minimal opposition, the Kaskans stopped returning home, choosing instead to lay waste to everything they touched. It seems like a bit of a stretch to say that nothing could stop him. Likely, they could have been stopped if Tudhalia had enough soldiers to stop them with. But instead, there was nothing the Hittite government could do for its north that would not jeopardize the east. The north was devastated in a way that would take generations to recover from. And not just that. You may recall that the Hattian homeland is relatively north-central in Anatolia. Hattusha itself, the Hittite capital, while well defended, is fairly close to these depredations. And fairly soon into the reign of Tudhalia, perhaps only a handful of years after he gained his kingship, the Kaskan hordes appeared outside the walls of Hattusha itself. You have to remember, Hattusha, though large by ancient standards, was never a great metropolis quite like the great cities of Mesopotamia. It held, at its very peak, perhaps some 40,000 souls, but those glory days are still to come. At this point, perhaps 15 to 20,000 is a more reasonable guess, and only a fraction of that would be fighting age males. To make matters worse, there's every possibility that as the northern barbarians descended on the city, many of those fighting age males and the king himself were simply not present. We don't know very many details about the sack of Hattusha, except that it was absolutely devastating. Very little of the city and very few of its inhabitants were left behind, and if there was any resistance, it was of no long-term consequence. The city was left a complete wreck, and most Kaskans simply left afterwards, abandoning the city as Hittite raiders had abandoned the ruined Babylon some 200 years previously. In fact, though we don't have an exact year, the destruction of Hattusha just after 1400 BCE is very close to the 200th anniversary of Mershali's great raid. The two have nothing to do with each other, of course, aside from a sense of karmic justice, but hopefully this gives you a sense of how long the Hittites have been sort of muddling around since the glory days of the Old Kingdom. But we know that the king was not present in the city when it fell. Perhaps he fled when he saw the enemy coming, but it seems more likely that the king and much of the government was out on campaign, one of the obscure and pointless military incursions that perpetually distracted the great kings of Hattusha. Where does he go when he gets the news? What does he do? These answers are lost to us, because whatever his initial intentions were, the flood has descended on the Hittite Empire in a way not seen since the empire's near destructions in the Old Kingdom. In the West, all those disloyal leaders split from what they saw as a sinking ship, and the tiny kingdoms that had labored under Hittite domination rose up and grabbed what they could. Similarly, in the east, the Mitanni launched a campaign to retake pretty much everything that the previous Tudhalia and his son Arnawanda had managed to capture. There are historians who suspect that this whole process took a while, but the impression we get from the Hittite chronicles themselves when reflecting back on this dark time was that this great encirclement happened nearly overnight, at least relatively speaking. There is a seeming suggestion that all of the Hittite Empire's neighbors conspired to attack at once, but I think it's more likely that the rest of the world saw how devastating the Kaskan raids were, and with the sack of the Hittite capital, wrote the whole nation off as a carcass to start plucking while there was still good meat on the bones. And indeed, it's hard to be sure that even the bones were left here, if we take the most radical, literal interpretation of these later histories. We really get the impression that in the darkest hours, the Hittite Empire consisted of nothing more than a king, some soldiers, and whatever soil they happened to be standing on at the moment. In this darkest version of events, Tudhalia won a single victory in all this defeat capturing the southeastern town of Samuha from the badly overextended far northern power of Azi Hayasa to serve as capital in the years to come. 
A bit more generous reading would suggest that the region around the Marasayanta River, both Samuha and perhaps the region around Old Kanesh, remained intact. Additionally, Kizawatna may not have switched sides, though this may be more because the situation moved so quickly that they didn't get a chance. Still, even in this tiny southeast Anatolian bastion, the Hittite kingdom existed on shaky foundations. The chronicles list that even obscure Syrian kingdoms were able to walk right in and pillage the region. And given the fact that the Hittite government was basically an extended collection of vassals, you have to wonder just how far the local lords in this region were willing to stick their necks out for what surely looked like a crumbling empire. Perhaps the king and his army were, for a time, squatters, living on conquered land and borrowed time. Perhaps they maintained rule over a tiny rump state, just waiting for the final blow to fall. Either way, things are not looking good for the Hittites. Things were, however, looking quite good for the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep III. He had peace in his Syrian possessions, an alliance with one major power, and a vacuum where he had previously expected a threat. Into this vacuum, the quickly emerging power of Arzawa seemed like the natural horse to back. Culturally, Arzawa probably didn't look all that different from the Hittites, just focused a bit further west, and thus less of a threat in the Syrian theater. And really, we haven't said much at all about Arzawa, except to mention it here and there as an enemy, but this is because there hasn't been much to say. The kingdom itself was situated around the capital city of Pasa, which would, in classical and later times, come to be known as the city of Ephesus, which would be famous in both Greek and New Testament history. Aside from matters of political history and geography, however, details about Arzawa are either obscure or heavily debated. It isn't clear, for instance, if Arzawan was a separate ethnic cultural designation, or if the Arzawans were Luwians, speaking the Luwian language. Some split the difference, saying that Arzawan was a subset of Luwian, who was the general name for most South Anatolian peoples, as opposed to the northern Hattians, who were the ethnic group that the Hittites mostly rule over. But in terms of daily life, they were mostly governed by the same climactic and economic realities of the Hittites, and would have recognized many of the aspects of Hittite daily life outlined back in episodes 63 and 64, if in a slightly different language, with slightly different gods, and slightly different crops. And even the gods weren't all that different either. Though their fortunes had waxed and waned over the years, it appears the Arzawan position on the Mediterranean coast made them a regular, if small, participant in the Levantine trade. All this seems to have made them a natural choice to replace the Hittites as the power in the region, and Pharaoh Amenhotep sent a letter to the Arzawan king Tarun Daradu. It began as these letters always did by informing the Arzawan king that in Egypt all was well, then wishing that all be well in the recipient's lands. The letter then says that it comes attached with a messenger, a man named Urshapa, who is going to take custody of one of the Arzawan king's daughters and deliver her to Pharaoh as a wife. Though we don't have the preceding letters, this is not just the pharaoh stealing foreign women. This is the conclusion of a diplomatic alliance, and the messenger has with him some oil to go ahead and anoint the daughter in the presence of the Arzawan king, her father, to do the first half of the long-distance wedding ceremony. Also included with the letter is a sizable amount of treasure, 20 mina of gold, a few hundred fine linen clothes, some attractive pots, as well as ebony furniture and ebony dishes, listed as greeting gifts, but given the fineness and domestic nature of the gifts were almost certainly meant as a wedding present, though not the actual bride price, which is coming later. The letter then discusses some standing businesses, but only in the vaguest terms, and it's referred to so obliquely that there's no real way to say what they're referring to, only that another messenger is on the way who'll resolve the matter. 
The pharaoh then asks for some caskins, by which he means exotic northern slaves. Pharaoh loved to collect exotic peoples from around the world, and these folks who most Egyptians probably had never heard of before the sack of Hattusha, from some mountains at the northern limit of the world, definitely qualified as exotic. And then the pharaoh says something interesting. He says, I've heard that everything is finished, that the land of Hattusha is paralyzed. Everyone, it seems, has heard about the shakeup in Anatolia, and both locals and distant powers agree that the time of the Hittites has ended. But we also have a reply from Arzawa to Egypt, which makes us wonder if Arzawa is actually equipped to take up the vacant great power slot. On the face of it, it appears to be a simple agreement that the marriage will go forward, as well as a note that one member of the Egyptian diplomatic mission appeared untrustworthy. Fairly banal as these sorts of letters go, but the joy of having even these boring letters is that they can be full of tiny details that the scribe might not even realize he's writing into it. The first thing of note is that the Arzawan king omits the formal greetings found in most other Amarna letters. Is this ignorance of high diplomatic custom, or an intentional move for one of many possible reasons? Additionally, there's no greeting gift, not even a small one, hinted at anywhere in this short message. Was Arzawa too poor to send a gift, or were they so backwards as to be ignorant of proper customs? Just as we ask this question today, so too were the courtiers of Egypt probably asking it as well. Then, after the signature, there's a small scribal note, meant for the Egyptian scribes to read, but not necessarily transmit to his master. This is not uncommon in Bronze Age letters, and these margin notes are often quite revealing in what the scribe will say when he thinks most folks can't read his writing. In this case, he blesses the other scribe in the name of the Anatolian sun god and in the name of Ea, the king of wisdom, a Mesopotamian god with an epithet that puts us in mind of the Hurrian Kumarbi cycle, suggesting a Hurrian influence even in distant Arzawa. But most interesting here is that the very last line of this postscript encourages the other scribe to write future letters in the Neshite language, that being the Hittite tongue and the lingua franca of Anatolia. While this scribe could apparently read and write Akkadian, as could everyone trained in the Edubas which taught youths across the Middle East, he seems to have had great difficulty with the language and preferred a more local tongue for important communications. All of this paints a picture of Arzawa as a kingdom that hasn't quite made the adjustments needed to join the great power club of the late Bronze Age. Indeed, what we see politically as well is that though Arzawa was perhaps in a better position than any of the other carrion birds swarming the not quite dead corpse of the Hittite Empire, they never made any push to claim the now empty Hittite heartlands for themselves. This may have been a mere lack of vision, though perhaps more likely, they worried that whoever put themselves into the interior of the old Hattian lands exposed themselves to the same multi-sided attacks that had just felled Tudhalia's kingdom. Whatever the case, these middle lands, including a small enclave where the last Hittite remnants were holed up, were heavily raided, but not occupied over the next few years. This means that while everyone else was squabbling over the prizes of a new world order, Tudhalia had breathing space to sit on his throne in Samuha and plot a return to the old order. Tudhalia had some wealth stored up, and he had some soldiers, both chariots and infantry, backing him up. But most importantly, he had a man considered by some to be the single most brilliant of all Hittite generals, his son Shapililiuma. Much as the previous Tudhalia had spent much of his reign in a co-regency with his military son Arnawanda, so too did this Tudhalia employ his son Shapililiuma extensively, and it's often guessed that much of the genius involved in retaking the Hittite Empire was Shapililiuma's doing. Goodness, what a terrible name, and we've got four more episodes of it. Anyway, 
Much like the king of Arzawa, Shapililiuma and Tudhalia saw the danger of moving back to the Hittite heartland while threats still encircled it. And so, they hatched the bold plan of retaking their empire by not retaking it. They made themselves comfortable in Samuha, whose location is unknown but must have been pretty far southeast and thus well into the Hurrian cultural sphere, thus further Hurrianizing a dynasty already heavily influenced by their eastern neighbors. Though I mention this here, it won't play that much role uh, until much later when the Hurrian influence begins to really affect the culture of the royal court in the new kingdom. For now, it's just a background note that Tudhalia likely didn't even take much note of at the time. After what was likely a frantic shifting of course, the Hittites sent out north to pound the Cascans into utter submission. Was this an act of vengeance or a recognition that this was the first threat which needed to be eliminated? It could well have been both, and it must surely have been satisfying for Tudhalia to see the barbarians who had sacked his capital put to the torch in what seems to have been a multi-year campaign of plunder and destruction. This Kaskin campaign went far to the north, where the Hittites encountered what seems to have been a fairly new power in the region, having unified a portion of the Caucasus Mountains around where modern Armenia sits. This nation, called Azi Hayasa, sometimes Hayasa Azi, has encountered the Hittite army earlier in the Kaskin expedition, but withdrew with either light fighting or no fighting. Still, Shepililiuma had Azi Ahayasa on his hit list and plunged the essentially homeless Hittite military deep into the Armenian mountains. What they did there is shrouded in the mists of time, but when Shepililiuma's army emerged at the end of the campaign season, the Azi Ahayasa of the Caucasus Mountains had signed away their independence to become vassals of the Hittite Empire. In a later confirmation of this treaty, likely a formalization of the arrangement some years later, the tone of the relationship is set very clearly between now King Shapililiuma and the ruler of Azihayasa. Thus says Majesty Shapililiuma, King of Hatti, I have now elevated you, Hukana, a lowly dog, and treated you well. In Hattusha, I have distinguished you among the men of Hayasa and given you my sister in marriage. Now, the entire quite lengthy treaty reaffirms this general power dynamic, and there's even a fantastic little admonition that Hukana should not practice incest with his close relatives, saying, In Hatti land, whoever commits such an act does not live, he dies. In your country, you do not hesitate to marry your own sister or sister-in-law or cousin because you are not civilized. Such an act cannot be permitted in Hatti. And of course, since Azihayasa is now part of the Hittite Empire, their uncivilized ways must also end. With this, the Hittite army turned west to subjugate the many minor nations who had once been their vassals. They appear to have faced very little resistance, or, as some would suggest, Shapililiuma was just such a genius general that he made it look easy. Probably a bit of both, as many West Anatolian states appear to have had few or no chariots, and many of their chariots may have been recently plundered from the Hittites themselves, not built natively. Arzawa, however, was not touched in this campaign. In fact, Arzawa may have been in the middle of a succession crisis, hitting right in the middle of what should have been their golden opportunity to expand. Though details are very fragmentary, it may be that the letter to Egypt around this point represented one side in the civil conflict, while the other branch of the family was in fact pursuing ties with the Hittites instead to press their claims on the Azawan throne. Whatever the case, much of northwest Anatolia was secured just in time for the Kaskans to start acting up again. 
A second Kaskin campaign was launched to run down the miserable nomads. And in fact, some chronologies say it was during the second Kaskin campaign, not the first, that Azi Hayasa was subjugated. Whatever the case, pretty much all of northern Anatolia was finally quieted down by this campaign. And, still pointedly ignoring the Hattian heartland, overwhelmed the Arzawans, who may have put up quite a bit of a fight, judging by the number of gods that Shapililiuma credits for giving him victory, including both the dynastic gods, the sun goddess of Arina, and the storm god of Hatti, as well as the storm god of the army, and an incarnation of the Mesopotamian deity given the Hittite name Ishtar of the battlefield. Still, though Shupililiuma made some solid gains in this campaign, it was not an unvarnished success. Shupililiuma would be forced to station a subordinate there with his own sub-army, who would see mixed results in the years to come, preventing the Arzawans from breaking out, but losing more than one major campaign in the process. Still, with this, the backyard of the ruined Hittite Empire was finally secure, after perhaps a decade or more of fierce campaigning. The central homeland could finally be reoccupied, and Hattusha could be rebuilt. King Tudhalia, however, would never return to the home he had been forced from. It seems likely, given that he had multiple adult sons already upon taking the throne, that Tudhalia was by now fairly old. The stresses of campaign had afflicted him with some lingering illness, and he was confined to bed in Samuha. He still handled governmental works from here, it seems, at least to a certain extent, but he could not be moved and had only a short time left to live. It's likely that this short period saw quite a lot of activity, with large chunks of the military repurposed for building walls and structures. It's hard to say what exactly King Tudhalia had done with his life, especially since so many of our records are from people quite enamored with Shapililiuma, and so even before Shapililiuma's kingship, he tends to dominate the stage. And yet, having fallen from such a low and returned the kingdom to a state that was in many ways stronger than he had inherited it, and in the northern regions slightly larger, Tudhalia III must have been a remarkable leader, even if we can't say for sure what his role in all of this was. When he died of natural causes, the kingdom mourned, but looked optimistically to the next king, the natural heir, Tudhalia the Younger. Except that wasn't what Shapililiuma wanted, and so he murdered Tudhalia the Younger and took the throne for himself. Then he murdered a whole bunch of extra brothers for having the wrong answer to the question of who was king now. The newly rebuilt capital was bathed in blood, but in a very short, bloody spasm, the universe was set right, and Shapililiuma, the great general and son of Tudhalia III, was great king in Hattusha. This was overall a good thing for the kingdom except for the parts that will come later, which involve divine judgment and aren't going to be so good. But these things are like hangovers. They come long after the party has ended. And for the Hittites, the party is just getting started. However, in order to prevent the party from being interrupted halfway through, which I think we can all agree would represent a major party foul on my part, we need to close the action here. Next time, we'll start by taking a look at our dance partner here in this party, the Mitanni Kingdom, and what little we know about their actions in all of this. Mostly, it'll be an excuse to look at a few more Amarna letters, which will give us, or at least give me, a remarkably negative impression of the Mitanni King Tushrata, which will be all the better when we see him beaten by military genius King Shapililiuma. So join us next time to meet the villain, learn to despise him, then see him destroyed with righteous military action. Thank you for listening.